Good morning and welcome to textiles. This week is an introduction to our first unit of textiles. So underneath this post, you're going to see the outline for this course. Uh, you have this video right here, which I'm going to give you instruction on the notes for this unit. You'll see the Google Slides presentation for the notes for this unit, along with the uh, note booklet. So this week's work is to take a look at the outline, watch this video, and follow along with the notes and Google Slides, and do the pause pieces in your notebooklet. So similar to the Newfoundland notebooklet for Unit 3 for clothing, same kind of thing. You don't need to type in the notes from the Google Slides, but the pieces where I want your thoughts uh, you complete those and pass that in to me on the classroom. Okay, so Textiles 3101 is the 3000 level course. Pretty much the same as clothing, except uh, the projects would be a bit more advanced. So a lot more projects um, than clothing, but unfortunately where we're home, it's kind of hard to be able to do those. I will still post them. And if you have the materials at home, please try them and send me pictures because I love to see them. Um, and if not, um, it makes me very sad if uh, we're, we're not getting to make those things together, but I'll make it available to you. Okay, so unit one is called Textiles and Our World. And basically it is a unit focused on fashion history and the history of body adornment, the clothing that we wear, um, right from the beginning of civilization. So first we want to think about what is natural fibers. Natural fibers are what our clothing was made out of up until sometime in the 20th century, around actually the 1950s. Uh, so natural fibers, anything that comes from a natural source, not human made. So things like furs, uh, wool, linen, cotton. Those are the main ones that we think of. Linen is made from flaxseed, which you can also eat. Uh, and linen is sometimes made from a mix of flax and cotton, or flax and hemp, which is also another natural fiber, or hemp and cotton. Hemp, of course, comes from where the people laugh at a lot of that are the hemp plant the marijuana plant is uh used for making a textile product hemp is actually very very durable uh, i have a, a book bag made out of hemp it's very very strong it's a, a good fabric to make things out of if you're looking for something that can carry heavy things it's also good for tents too uh, these are all considered natural fibers anything that can be found harvested or created from animals or plants. And we get a bit more into natural fibers and break it down even more in unit two in this course. Okay, so ancient civilizations, got my big old coffee this morning, uh, that we look at are Egypt, Crete and ancient Greece, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, China, Japan, and Africa. Uh, you'll see on the Google Slides, it's right here for me, uh, that there's a complete timeline worksheet as we discuss. The worksheet is actually, this is an activity that goes along with our textbook, but I still left it there for you to see it, uh, just so uh, I could talk to you a little bit about the ancient civilizations. We just don't get the textbook stuff. All of these ancient civilizations have one thing in common. And that's the use of natural fibers, because it was before the use of natural fibers. Also, the fact that clothing at that particular time was used for protection. It wasn't until um, t a recorded time went along that clothing began to dignify between classes or between types of people. Uh, you really start to see that actually in ancient Rome. So in... Um, with different colors of fabrics. You see it also a bit in ancient Egypt with the use of jewelry or not wearing jewelry. Uh, 
but our other ancient civilizations, you don't see it quite as much. So ancient Egypt, people wore linen mostly, which was made from flax, and uh, their clothing was used to protect them from the elements. They also wore makeup, makeup on their face, which is considered body adornment. Mommy. Hold on one second. Yes? I'm my okay. My son is four, if you don't already know that. He has recently discovered Wii Sports, and this is what he's doing now to entertain himself while I make my videos. <laughs> so uh, they would wear makeup around their eyes actually to help protect their eyes against the sun. Say desert uh, is where they live, so they did that to protect their eyes from the sun. Uh, people who were of higher class or royalty also wore a lot of jewelry which would have been made from gold, also a uh, stone called lapis lazuli. Uh, Crete in ancient Greece, uh, they wore a lot of wool, actually. Um, had a lot of sheep and goats, uh, so a lot of their clothing was made from wool. Uh, you'll notice in the picture on the slide, uh, that picture is actually uh, a demonstration of the toga, uh, which is popular in the Roman Empire but also similar to the way people would wrap their bodies in Egypt and ancient Greece as well. Very similar. Uh, in class, if we were doing this in class, I would actually be showing you with each civilization how they would wrap their fabrics around their body. Because a lot of it wasn't sewn. It was used big, large pieces of fabric and tied with knots. Uh, an interesting thing about the Roman Empire, use of jewelry as well, same as ancient Egypt. Uh, was the presence of dye. Uh, we've talked about it before, when the fact that royalty had purple clothing. Uh, the reason why purple is considered to be a royal color is because purple dye was only available by uh, actually crushing, a, there's a particular sea snail that when crushed created purple pigment. It's very difficult to find. The only people who could afford that was royalty, thus purple becoming a royal color. Most everybody else, their clothing was white, beige to brown, because that's what was natural. You think cotton, white, flax and hemp, beige. A lot of wool, beige to brown. Uh, so that was the color of everyone else's clothes. And the royalty, like the emperor, and the, and the court of the Roman Empire had purple. Byzantine Empire, the interesting thing about them, the reason why they're on the list, is the fact that this was the first time that it was recorded that people wore pants as opposed to a toga or wrap around their legs. Who wore the pants? Women, Mommy. not men. Very interesting fact. Mommy. Yes, buddy. I'm sorry, I can't come see. I'm teaching my students now. Uh, China and Japan had the presence of silks. Silk is a natural fiber because silk comes from the silk worm. And people are like, yeah. When you think about it, silk comes from a silk worm. It's the way that they hang up trees. It comes up the butt. Uh, which people make the joke about that, but they have a pouch that it comes out of uh, next to their bum. And they make these strings, these fibers. And those fibers are collected and woven to make silk. Uh, China is also the first civilization to quilt fabrics. To quilt means to have fabric, something in between, and fabric on top of it to layer. That's what our quilts on our bed. To quilt something means to have those layers. And in ancient China, they were the first people to quilt. The reason why they quilted things was for winter coats, because in China, it would get very cold and there would be lots of snow and you'd need protection. Uh, so that's why China is there of note. Japan, same thing of uh, silks. Also, uh, their kimonos, which or both for men and women, and how beautifully adorned they were. Uh, covered in 
beautiful embroidery, uh, very ornate clothing in Japan. Uh, and then Africa, very similar to Egypt, Crete, and ancient Greece, and the Roman Empire, uh, with the use of large fabrics to uh, adorn their body, help keep them cool, and protect them from the sun. But also in Africa, is the use of a lot of different colored dyes, where uh, in the other ancient civilizations, they did not use dyes, it was only royalty. Many people in Africa had bright colored clothing because they found ways to color their clothing that was affordable or being able to be equal for all. All right, so historical events that might have influenced textiles. Uh, this is where we have a little brainstorm discussion. Major historical events that have influenced the textile industry. The first it's the Industrial Revolution, which is when uh, the first textile mills were created. Also, when the first machines were created uh, to make factories, to streamline processes. Before then, all clothing was made by hand, one thing at a time. All textile products, all fabrics made by hand, one thing at a time. The Industrial Revolution, the use of machinery, made, uh, made like the first... Um, looms, industrial size looms, sorry, not the first looms, but the first industrial size looms, um, and other machinery in order to streamline the process to make it faster to make fabric, therefore faster to make clothes. The second historical event that um, I would highlight if we were brainstorming in class would be the First World War. When that happened, everything shut down for major clothing companies, and everyone switched to making things for uh, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. Same thing during the Second World War. Uh, that also ended up influencing fashion, which we get to a little bit later. So now we have group discussion. Necessity is the mother of invention. This is two bullet points for influence, and there's a thing there from the textbook. Um, Obviously, we don't have the textbook, but I wanted to pause it. Necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, that means when you need something is when we as human beings invent something to help us out. That's where the Industrial Revolution came from. The need to create and the need to create things in mass uh, forced the hand of many people to invent machinery and uh, factory processes. Okay, so we're getting into cycle of fashion trends. So whenever something becomes popular that we wear, it goes through three steps. One, a design gets approval from people, from others. Then competitors try to copy that style and finally, the fad gets replaced because it is no longer original. The trend immediately stops being desirable once something new, and I put that in you know, air quotes, new comes along. Because nothing with fashion is ever new. This is the whole thing. It always cycles through. We're always influenced by something that came before us. So I use the example of Ugg boots. People still wear Ugg boots. But when they first became a major trend, everybody wanted them. So that's number one, gets approval. And so many people wanted to have them and wanted to wear them. Then competitors copy that style. So many footwear companies made their version of Uggs. And you were seeing knockoffs everywhere. And then the fad got replaced. What did it get replaced by? Anything? Blundstones. Yes, people still wear Ugg boots, but what boot replaced them was, well, some people actually uh, would argue that the um, rubber boots, what are they, Hurley boots? No. Yeah. I can't remember the name of them right now. But they've been replaced. People still wear them, uh, but they're not as popular as they once were. 
So there's a pause there. So this is one of the things that you will have to do in your notebooklet and pass it in on the classroom. Name three current fashion trends and three fashion trends that are no longer popular. You can use Uggs, uh, where I use that as an example, if you like. So think of things that have been popular that are no longer popular, three of those, and three that are current that people are wearing right now. All right, so now we're gonna talk about trends of the 20th century. Uh, the first decade here is 1900 to 1909. Uh, you'll see that lady there in the picture, she's wearing a corset. Look at how tiny her waist is. That's not a natural waist. That's a corseted waist. A corset is made out of thick fabric and in between that fabric would be boning. It's referred to as boning because it once was actually made out of bone, whale bone specifically. That's something I mentioned in unit three of clothing. Um, Something that was very popular why people came to Newfoundland to fish was not for fishing of cod, which is what we immediately think of. Another fishery was the whale fishery. Um, whales were killed for their blubber, for their oils, and also for their bones, because whale bone is what was used in corsets in Europe. Uh, now, of course, it's used by um, steel or different uh, other metals or with plastic if you're wearing a corset but at that time it was whalebone and it's pulled tight around the body from the bust to just below the hip and laced up on the back forces a woman to breathe up as opposed to out and very uncomfortable very very uncomfortable the most desirable waist measurement you've got a measuring tape at home take a look at it 18 inches all the way around that's uncomfortable very very tiny uh, and people wondered why women were treated as oh they were so, you couldn't upset them because they were so fair and so gentle because they could faint why did they faint because they were wearing corsets and they couldn't breathe properly and that's where the whole notion of women being you know fair and delicate started was when women were wearing corsets which started in the 1700s and fell out of fashion probably around between 1910 and 1920. Uh, so corsets were very popular in this first decade of the 20th century. Tall necklines with flowing skirts. You'll see the lady in the picture. The dress goes up to here and down to her wrists and all the way down to the floor. 1908 corsets gave way to loose fitting what was called a health dress so people started to realize that it wasn't very healthy to wear corsets all the time so they wore a health dress which was a little bit looser uh invention of the suit for both men and women women wore suits as well not necessarily with pants usually with a skirt but a jacket and skirt uh art nouveau floral prints floral prints were very very popular at this particular time so, uh, socialites from Paris, King Edward VII, and Prince Albert were the major influences on fashion. That's who people looked for. What were they wearing? They were the celebrities at the time. Uh, 1910 to 1919, uh, you'll see the lady in that picture. She's still most likely wearing a corset or a uh, type of uh, undergarment to tighten things in, just not with all the boning. Uh, you'll see she's also wearing a very, very large hat, and you can actually see her wrists. Uh, a barrel-type dress emerged that tapered at the ankle. Uh, so it was wider around the hip, and then the skirt tapered in. Pants for women would be worn underneath a tunic or a skirt. Uh, that appeared in fashion. But it wasn't very popular because women were afraid to wear it because men would get upset at them uh, for wearing it and it was considered if a woman wore pants that it was scandalous. Uh, turbans with feathers and skirts with high slits for women and oversized hats for both genders were all influences by the tango which was a dance that was very popular. 
Uh, World War I influenced dress. Designers and tailors converted to making uniforms and repurposing after the war. So I mentioned that earlier. Uh, a lot of clothing distributors uh, started making uniforms for the Army and the Navy and the Air Force. After the war, of course, they had to do something with all that clothes, so they repurposed it and it made its way into civilian fashion. Men's jackets were cut away to show their best, or their shirts that were in bright colors and floral prints. Floral prints in men's shirts is now popular again, so I find that interesting. That a hundred years later, that's what's popular in men's fashion again. And also the trench coat was invented uh, after World War I. Uh, it was a type of jacket that was worn over a uh, uniform and then it made its way to civilian life. 1920-1929 what the people are wearing in this picture is sportswear. The first sportswear uh, became popular in 1920-1929. These three people are at a country club and they are either going to go play golf or tennis. Uh, you would actually notice if you can see the gentleman uh, who's wearing the jacket and has his shirt unbuttoned up top, he's actually wearing sandals with socks. So men were still doing that then. <laughs> uh, the length of the skirt gradually changed over the decade with knee length for the day and mid calf for the evening. Ooh. Uh, and loose fit was popular. So corsets, all gone, all gone. Androgyny was incorporated in women's style, so women started wearing more uh, loose-fitting blouses that looked like men's shirts and pants, uh, short haircuts, uh, and that was uh, very, very popular at the time. Men's pants were very high-waisted and very wide, which you can see in the photo. And Playing sports influenced fashion, which it does today too. Oops. My camera slipped off of its holder. Sorry about that. I'll angle that a bit better. There. But yes, uh, fashion, of course, today we wear a lot of sportswear. Uh, but the first time that happened was in the decade of 1920 to 1929. 1930 to 39, the natural waistline became popular again with form fitting dresses. Belts and bodices were used to make the waist appear similar. So they would wear these wide belts, which you'll see in the photo, or they would wear uh, a, what was called a bodice underneath or a girdle, which was fabric, no boning, and laced up in the back. Uh, the bell cut dress was popular. That was like a bell shape uh, for women who were body conscious. Uh, emergence of the evening gown. The first evening gowns were in the 30s. Um, with long and flowing with trains, satin and silks. Very pretty. Uh, Double-breasted men's suits were popular with four buttons. One, two, like say, across. Uh, and then they would expose their shirt as opposed to wearing a vest. Large collars and shoulder pads for both uh, men and women at the time. Shoulder pads we think of as an 80s thing, but they first emerged in the 1930s and then came back in the 80s. So again, fashion cycles goes around, goes around. Uh, flashy pattern shirts for men became popular. So there was floral prints before this, and now there's different other geometric patterns and all these bright colors stuff in men's fashion. Again, came back in the 80s. Uh, so you have this 50 year turnover um, where things started to come back. 1940 to 49, of course, big decade is uh, the Second World War. During World War II, clothing was at a standstill with people being encouraged to repurpose and make their own. People didn't buy things. You're encouraged not to buy because the economy was at a standstill because all of the money from different countries was going towards the military efforts. Uh, so repurpose what you have. If you have clothing at home, fix it. If it is torn or ripped, if it doesn't fit, pass it on to somebody else 
and help each other out. Uh, shoulders and collars became very wide. Big, big collars and lapels. You'll, uh, and you'll see lapels in the ladies in the picture. 1947, a new look emerged from high fashion with small lapels, no shoulder, like shoulder pads, and slim skirts with slits. It's considered uh, the new look from Paris. Didn't get really, really popular, but some people in Europe did wear clothing like that. Um, and same from uh, high fashion, high fashion, so we refer to as haute couture, which is our fashion houses, which I get to again in a little bit later. So uh, Chanel, uh, Vogue, Prada, uh, all of our major fashion labels, Louis Vuitton, uh, those companies. 1948 was the invention of the bikini, um, but it wasn't accepted. Uh, it was, it appeared uh, during Fashion Week in Milan, in 1948, but it was considered way too scandalous, and it wasn't until the 1960s that the bikini became popular. Uh, the jazz scene influenced what was called the zoop suit, which was a large suit with large oversized pants, big jackets, big hats for men to wear, uh, and that was very popular in the United States. And then uh, fashion was still mirrored the military with uniformed looking suits like you see in the photo. 1950 to 59, uh, this image there is uh, not a photo, but a drawing. That's why her waist looks so teeny. Um, this is unrealistic look. Uh, this is a, an image from a, an Eaton's catalog. Eaton's no longer exists, but it was a major retailer and department store and catalog company in Canada at the time. Uh, creation of, a, of synthetic materials made ironing part of the past. Most everything was made from cotton, linen, flax, remember all of those things we talked about, and wool. Synthetic materials, i.e. polyester, uh, elastin, spandex, um, lycra, all of these fabrics started to come on scene in the 1950s. And the 1950s though was specifically polyester. You don't have to iron polyester. It's not half as wrinkly as cotton. So uh, there were blends made with cotton and polyester so that uh, you didn't have to iron as soon as uh, you washed something. It was considered what was called ready to wear fashion. Uh, the A-line skirt became popular. A-line means it was small at the top, big at the bottom. Looks like a big capital A. Uh, bodices and girdles drew in the waist, so again, they're still wearing these uh, garments underneath their clothes to draw in the waist to make it appear smaller. Just didn't have boning in it. A t-shirt dress became an all-occasion cotton hit. So the t-shirt dress was something that was a dress that was casual that a woman could wear during the day uh, to do her shopping, to uh, do her housework. And then in the evening, she could change into a more glamorous dress. But uh, during the day, she'd wear a t-shirt dress. And that's the ad that I have there on that slide. The true transition cotton, a real fashion first. So it was considered this casual look. Definitely not our casual look of today. Flat rounded toed shoes then turned to the 1956 introduction of the stiletto. Stiletto, of course, the pointed heel, pointed toe. <coughs> Emergence of teenage fashion. Uh, teens wore jeans, cotton shirts, and some influenced by the jazz scene wore all black, turtlenecks, and tight leather. 1950s was the first time that teenagers were targeted for fashion. Before then, it was just adults. Uh, People realized in the 1950s that there was a transition between childhood and adulthood, and it was the first time you ever heard of the term teenager, uh, which, of course, all of you are. Uh, and now we have a big focus of change because the teen fashion industry is what uh, is a major push now for, uh, for clothing companies, is you. You are the target audience. Uh, bit of English terms coming in there, but you are. Until the 1950s, that wasn't a thing at all. 
Jeans also were worn before the 1950s just by factory workers because denim is a durable material that was less likely to tear or rip if you're in a factory setting. But teenagers like jeans. They're comfortable. And so the teenagers just started wearing it. And jeans now tra completely then transformed. Uh, because now we wear jeans as part of our regular everyday clothing. Uh, 1960-69, I love the picture of these two ladies with their very large plastic earrings and their geometric shaped dresses. Love it. Uh, the London look, and that's what this refers to, is called the London look. Influenced fashion greatly out of London, England, of course. Bright colours, plastic discs, uh, straight lines, uh, this like geometric look, uh, dresses that were shorter, they were referred to as a mini dress. Very popular. Emergence of beatnik or hippie fashion influenced global attire, which meant furry coats, uh, Aboriginal or Indigenous inspired shirts, flowers, beads, big sweaters. The funny thing is, what I'm wearing today is considered influenced by the 1960s hippie fashion. Big, large, knitted sweaters, which are still popular. Well, the thing's not still popular. They went out of fashion and then came back. Again, fashion cycles. Uh, the Beatles influenced men's fashion huge thing, the, you know, the Beatles craze. And then in 1965, the mini skirt became popular. Okay, so I referred to mini dress or mini skirt. Mini skirts, before then, of course, everything was below the knee. The mini skirt meant it was above the knee, about an inch above the knee. And it was considered a mini skirt. And that was very much pushing fashion. Oh my goodness. Now, of course, what we wear as what people would consider a mini skirt emerged in the 1990s, referred to as the micro mini. Uh, the micro mini, which is now the mini skirt, comes down just below the bum. Very, very, very short. Uh, the original mini skirts were not that short. They came to about an inch above the knee. 1970 to 79, this is the uh, era of my parents in their teenage years. Uh, the early 1970s influenced by Middle Eastern look of patterns, sweaters, and pants, uh, still overflowing from the hippie fashion of the 1960s. A wear-what-you-will attitude came to uh, be the post-hippie era with large knit sweaters, <laughs> uh, jeans, comfortable, cozy, natural clothing. Jeans became the norm across all classes. And you see that in the men's uh, photo there. This is an ad for Lee Jeans, uh, also from an Eaton's catalog. Uh, he's wearing jeans and a jean jacket with a polyester shirt underneath that and a turtleneck underneath that. Lots of layers. 1976, hot pants emerged. What's hot pants? Short shorts. Mini shorts. Uh, wasn't just a summer look. Um, my mother told me of uh, people wearing them, including herself, with tall wool socks that came up above the knee. So you'd wear your hot pants and big tall wool socks so you could still wear them outside. Uh, layered looks like the image that's on the slide were very popular. Uh, T-shirts, bell-bottom pants, then also then shirts and sweaters or a turtleneck, a shirt, and a jacket. Remembering also polyester was very, very popular in the 70s. Very popular. Remember, polyester is made from plastic. Polyester does not breathe. So think of all those layers. And one of those layers being polyester. Very sweaty. Uh, the punk look swept through the late 1970s with spikes, safety pins, mohawks, dark colors. Uh, that's where it started was the 70s and in uh, England with the band The Sex Pistols. Look them up. Uh, the, they're pretty interesting, especially if you're into some uh, music history. Uh, the book Dress for Success came out in the 1970s to help instruct young people of how to dress for work because it was seen that the kids coming out of high school, didn't know how to wear clothes properly, and they didn't know how to dress professionally. So this book came out, Dress for Success, and that ended up influencing, actually, a lot of fashion of the 1980s. Uh, 1980 to 1989, 
business suits are very popular. People in their late teens and early 20s, because of this book Dress for Success, found that they had to wear formal clothing. You may have heard of the term uh, yuppies, wasps. Um, these terms came out of the 1980s of, um, think of sociology at the time, uh, where the middle America uh, corporate kind of um, look and embodiment that you had to have, you know, the good office job, the business suit, uh, the newest things, uh, go out with friends and have money to spend on restaurants and bars. Um, that's what success was measured by in the 1980s for someone in their late teens through their 20s. Uh, silhouette was defined by the voluminous sleeve, voluminous big fluffy, called a gigot, uh, came out of France, uh, high fashion. A large shoulder pads in jackets and evening wear. The lady in that picture, my goodness, her shoulders. Big shoulder pads. A uh, jersey body suits, body suits, excuse me, replaced the blouse, and a fitness craze influenced day fashion with ballet leg warmers. Um, so people got really into aerobics and sportswear of aerobics and dance uh, influenced everyday fashion. Calvin Klein created the designer jean and the modern men's underwear. Uh, Calvin Klein came up with this idea. Well, all these teenagers. And young people are wearing jeans. Jeans, everybody wears jeans. But it's not considered high fashion. How do I make it high fashion? And he invented designer jeans. So what he did was just slapped his label on the uh, belt loops. There along the back. And made the designer jean. Mark them up two and a half uh, times the price for a regular pair of jeans. And people ate it up. People are still eating it up. There are all these designer jeans now that are so expensive. You could get a regular pair of jeans for a good price. But what are the jeans that you want? You want the true religion jeans. You want the uh, Calvin Klein jeans. People want uh, the Levi's, which Levi's used to be uh, like not high-priced or considered designer. People want it because of the label. Calvin Klein created that because he was seeing a way for him to make more money. Same thing with um, men's underwear. Put his name across the elastic band. That's all he did. And then put up this big giant uh, billboard in Times Square. This happened in the 80s. And then all these people, all these men wanted Calvin Klein underwear. Calvin Klein underwear was like 50 bucks. For a pair of underwear. Uh, the business suit was in for uh, both uh, men and women. Androgyny and haute couture uh, even brought in a skirt for the body conscious man. So androgyny came back from the 1920s uh, for, uh, for fashion. A collarless suit became popular towards the end of the decade, going into the 90s. Uh, and Madonna and pop icons influenced fashion. 1990 to 1999, the last decade of the 20th century, the question became, what designer are you wearing? What are you wearing? Who are you wearing? Um, and fashion designers were what was considered the be-all and the end-all. The beginning of the decade saw patterned leggings with loose-fitting shirts over top, sometimes transparent or with a stylish bustier, bustier's type of bra. Uh, jeans and baggy shirts became the norm for the younger generation. Jeans were everywhere. Uh, seeing the image, uh, this was from MTV Music Awards, I believe. Instead of wearing big dresses or gowns, what are they wearing? jeans. Uh, wrinkled shirts, uneven hemlines, and inside-out seams became acceptable. Uh, sports labels became popular as everyday wear, such as Adidas and Nike. Uh, that's, of course, what we see today still, uh, 30 years later. Uh, a great amount of fashion is sports labels. And cargo pants were first introduced as sportswear. Uh, sportswear for uh, people who like skateboarding and snowboarding but uh, that became popular in all fashion. Uh, another pause here, so this is in your notebooklet, so you would fill this in for submitting on the Google Classroom. What are some fashion trends from 2000 to today so that you've seen in your life? 
in the past 20 years. Um, what are uh, fashion trends that you see? Now remember a trend goes through a cycle, so it's around for a while, so a number of years or for a decade. So what are some trends that you've seen? All right, so we're gonna talk about the diff what a fad or a craze is. It's different from a trend, so remember a trend has some staying power, could last for up to a whole decade. But a fad or a craze is different. A fad and a craze are both defined as the same. An intense and widely shared enthusiasm for something, especially one that is short-lived and without basis in the object's qualities. People just want it because it's popular. It has nothing to do with it being good quality. Uh, so something like silly bands. Silly bands were a fad. Uh, what's another fad? Something that became really popular really quick. Uh, East Coast Lifestyle. Oh, this is Sophie. Hello. Um, uh, anything that became very, very popular very, very quickly just because people wanted it, not because it was something necessarily high quality. Okay, the last section is haute couture, which is high fashion or high sewing. A haute couture literally means high sewing in French. It implies the highest level of quality and detail. And the criteria for haute couture were established in 1945 uh, by a particular panel. And then they were updated again in 1992. So the criteria, it, it depended on like how many employees you had, how many things that you uh, made per year, the fabrics that you had to use. Uh, also, the fact that you had to make everything by hand, it couldn't be mass made. And also, things had to be made for people in particular, so customized. And then the industry is a regulating commission. Okay, buddy, good for you. There's a new record in Poland. Wow. That's a lot. The industry has a regulating commission called the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. My French accent isn't the best, I apologize. Uh, and the regulating commission came up with the criteria. So we talk about uh, Haute Couture's purpose. The exclusivity of Haute Couture actually causes design houses to lose money. Um, so why do they do it? Uh, they create these fashions anyway to create desirability for their ready-to-wear clothing. So this image that you see there in this very painful looking dress is from Fashion Week in France. Uh, Lady Gaga wore this dress at an event after uh, this fashion show. Uh, are people expected to actually purchase that dress and wear it? Nah. -uh. But the company that created this dress that year had metallic geometric prints on their ready-to-wear clothing, on their shirts and their dresses. So that garment was supposed to create hype for the metallic look of their line for their ready-to-wear clothing. That's why they do it. Uh, couture can be a way to experiment with new expense, expensive fabrics and techniques before introducing them to the mass market. But the infeasibility of creating couture clothing leads many to criticize its practicality and its ability to survive in the modern age. So, so a lot of people who, uh, who are very critical of it. Why are we still doing it if it costs so much money? Um, you think of uh, Fashion Week in Milan was actually closed. Um, who was the first? What was it Versace? I think it was Versace was the first ones to have their they had their fashion show without an audience that was early february just before um italy closed down because they started seeing people getting sick um so fashion fashion week and fashion shows was in the past like month and a half uh, would have been so actually what's very interesting is the fact that these hook tour like they lose money anyway on these fashion shows but it creates hype for their ready-to-wear clothing. They didn't even get the hype from that this year because a lot of the fashion shows didn't go ahead or they were closed. So a lot of these companies, high fashion companies, have lost a lot of money um, this year. Um, so the last pause there uh, on the final slide um, is, do you think that haute couture 
should still exist in today's society. Why or why not? And that there in your notebook, I left about like a larger section so you could write a paragraph. Um, because I'm interested in your thoughts. And I think especially considering what is going on right now um, is a big influence on it. Do, should it still exist today? Is this something that should still be considered important in with all of today's goings on? I'm very interested to hear those thoughts from you. Okay, so that's everything for notes wise and the like for this unit. So what you're going to do this week is um, do the little pause sections that are in the notebooklet, submit that on the classroom by Friday. And then there's going to be a little um, project, which uh, I'll get you to do next week. Okay, so until then, um, take care of yourself. And I'll send you another post on Monday. I'm still very attached to my email. Email me anytime or message me on the classroom. I miss you. Bye-bye.